bringing uh, the um, topic of this presentation, whether by life or by death. The statements made in Philippians, the first chapter, verse 20. So this is a, the first of a presentation of a study of the Philippian letter. The aim uh, is to show that when a primary relationship exists within the members of the body of Christ, the fatherance of the gospel of God and Christ Jesus will be accomplished. The church will be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the praise of the glory of God. These are statements taken from the Philippians, the first chapter, and so the text for this will be that chapter and carrying on through to, uh, in the uh, second chapter, the first 11 verses. The Apostle Paul, then, and the saints in Christ Jesus, who are Philippi, along with the uh, elders and the deacons enjoyed a primary relationship. Our study of the various elements of their primary relationship will help us to appreciate how the body of Christ is held together by the primary relationships of the members of the church. Now, as always, we have um, the aim of these presentations is to help maturing Christians to learn to study the Bible for themselves. And so we are going to take the time in this uh, presentation also to bring forth the principles again, as we have over and over uh, in this 300 series. We presented the book of Ephesians the first time, and the reason being choosing that letter was that Paul spent two years there preaching the kingdom of God. Uh, however, as we would read about that in the Acts, the 19th chapter, verses 8 to 10, uh, that he uh, did not, uh, the uh, Luke did not record in there what he preached. And so we get that from his letters. And so the Ephesian letter was uh, uh, covering many topics that Paul would have covered as he preached the kingdom of God. In the Colossian letter then, it, has a, it was somewhat of a review of what Paul preached uh, or had written in the Ephesian letter. Here we're taking, there is another uh, approach, uh, and we, we lay these letters one over the other as they would, uh, uh, the Ephesian letter is our commentary that will cover many of these topics and the others will fit in there. Remember there in the first chapter in verses 3 through 14, all spiritual blessings are in Christ. And he lists, gives us a long list. But here we want to go into the historical setup between Paul and the uh, Philippian church to uh, fully understand then what he's saying to them. So what we are talking about then uh, doing exegesis. Uh, exegesis, just a uh, technical word, simply means going to the then and there historically and seeing what Paul is writing, seeing the church, the recipients of his letter, as he's seen them. And uh, so that will help us then to have a control over how we hear what he says. And of course, when we, in our literary analysis, where uh, he, is, he is speaking to us in literature, so we need to learn how to read that literature. So for simple principles that we can do this, we ask about the time and the culture and, and of that, and we need to then, of course, to have a good understanding of the book of Acts. Uh, a, a Christian would have, naturally, of course, to understand the Acts, the preaching of the kingdom of God in Acts. We need to know the four Gospels, what Paul, what Jesus actually taught the apostles to uh, preach and how the Holy Spirit you know, come and brought that message in a way that they would fully understand it. And so we then, uh, we do our historical analysis, in fact, all the way back to Genesis, in fact, all the way back before what was in God's mind before he made the world. If we wanted to go there, we'd go to the A100 series. We did that so that we, we understand then uh, the whole history of the Bible 
but here coming right down to read this particular letter at this particular time, we ask about the time and the culture of the author and the receiver, and we will look into that and see the relationship they had over these years. We ask about the purpose of the doctor. Why is he writing this? And that will need to be brought out uh, as we do this reading. So I know when we sit down personally, we're going to read these letters several times. We're going to make sure we understand the words and so forth. And uh, uh, when we see these words, we have to examine them. We want to understand what is being said to a particular situation. We examine the paragraphs grammatically and contextually. And the most important contextual question will always be, as we are moving through the letter, we're moving from thought to thought. So in each thought, the question is, what is the author's point of right here? What is he saying right here? Well, that means it fits into the overall letter. We do that work. It's simple. We do that when we uh, get a letter in the mail. We do that. Uh, we know how to read <laughs> letters, and we know how to read stories. But in the Bible, there is this uh, been this habit that's happened of people picking and choosing uh, here and there. And it just, we know better. So we need to do better when we know better. So along with this, uh, there's two other things we want to keep in mind, and these have been brought out before. Uh, follow the author's style or his train of thought. Well, naturally, uh, if you're reading a book or you're reading anything, and the, if you, the, you, he loses you, or she is the author, it might be, in the books. Uh, this was written by Paul, so uh, we have to follow his style. He had different styles he used in different letters. And of course, if uh, he is bringing forth a topic, say, uh, of the kingdom of God, and you don't know the kingdom of God, then you need to go do your homework, because he will not explain that here. The church was converted to the kingdom of God, so they knew exactly what he's talking about. We may not know that. And so uh, we, we need to get some help there in developing the skill for reading the literature and the Bible. And that skill would be we do an exegetical approach to it. And once we have clearly understood what was going on and then read it in that context, we are now ready to talk about how to learn from literature. And the word is hermeneutics. These are simply technical words. Uh, this, uh, these notes here that I have presented was from a book written by uh, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by uh, Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. Uh, this was a signed, a signed reader back in the college days when you were learning how to do uh, this very theme of um, biblical interpretation principles. So we will apply those as we go along. And the aim of these YouTube presentations are dedicated to assisting maturing Christians to develop the skill. It is a skill for reading the various kinds of literature in the Bible. And so we know that anything we're going to do uh, in the world, in our everyday life, is a skill. And then so we do that. We do that with the Bible. Accordingly, we appreciate ourselves uh, uh, to read the Philippian letter by traveling the uh, with Paul. We can travel with him as he went to Macedonia. Paul, Silas, and Luke were there coming to this uh, Macedonian area and the Philippi. And um, so we go with them. We need to have a little outline of we need to sense when we're doing historical anything. We need to have a sense of time and the geography. So uh, we need to have us a map, and uh, most of us have maps in the back of our uh, Bible, and this, of course, would be then his second missionary journey, and we can see those things. You can read them for yourself. So we get all of this in our mind, uh, traveling with Paul. So when he writes to that letter, we're up and going for that. Uh, these are there for your own you can pause and look at these things. This is, this, uh, is, a, is a teaching lesson. It, it hopefully is a self-teaching lesson. 
where you can pause and study the scriptures for yourself. So historical analysis, as we've seen, there, there's two points that we want to take up right here and, and, and apply them. We ask about the time and the culture of the author and the receivers of the document. We ask about the purpose of the document. So we see then Jesus Christ, the king, would have been the source of this special evangelistic mission. This is particularly a time when Paul, he, uh, he is moving, he is preaching, he wants to go uh, in one place, Pontus, but uh, no, no, he says, and so he gets a vision. This a vision, a man in Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So this was a special a direct commission, where to go? And he went there. And then when he is, he is writing here in this letter, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out to be the fatherance of the gospel. So this is, uh, there is something happened to Paul. What happened to him? Well, uh, at the end of his uh, third missionary journey, he uh, winds up uh, a prisoner uh, of the Roman government. And so the, uh, to avoid then uh, being executed by them, uh, the um, uh, there at the plea of the Israelite high priest, he appealed to, uh, to Caesar. And so he wound up as a prisoner finally going there. And so, he, <coughs> excuse me, uh, he is saying, uh, I want you to know, brethren, these things which happened to me have actually turned out for the fatherance of the gospel. Now, this is going to deal with our, all of us to help us to understand what is a primary relationship. And as we know, a primary relationship involves then that all of those people involved have a single mission in mind. And in other words, an overriding. They may have several along the line, but we have this overriding uh, one. And so the overriding mission of Paul and the Macedonians, uh, the churches in Macedonia, was a fatherance of the gospel. And we're learning also what should be the attitude of a church. The not only what we receive of understanding the gospel. What does the word gospel mean? Well, to many people it means, oh, Jesus died on the cross for me and happily I have the forgiveness of my sin. Well, as we would go back and read the four gospels, we would understand that the gospel was the preaching of the kingdom of God. And that's what Paul and Jesus Christ did. He also had the apostle school and taught them to preach that. And coming into Acts, that's what they taught. And so now with the church, uh, what would we do? We're going to uh, be in fellowship to father that. So this is, the, this is that which we're all dedicated to, not only to enjoy, but to uh, we are the ones. Jesus came and he is gone. Uh, the apostles were here and they're gone. Who is there left? It's the church. And that's what Paul is dealing with. And that was their goal together. And so now he is he's going to convince them that uh, good things are happening. It is happening. And so he wants to point that out. We'll see more about that. What happened? Well, he is in prison there. He, as we would read in the last chapter, last uh, two verses, actually, of Acts, that he was there for two years. He was allowed to have a guard, and he had his own place. And so he continued to preach the kingdom of God. And even the palace guards and all the rest, he is saying, they understood that my chains were in Christ, even though I had, they had me physically chained here as a Roman prisoner. Uh, but actually, uh, uh, he wasn't chained in the inner man, and he was still preaching the kingdom of God. And so he's saying most of the brethren in the Lord, they have been excited about this. So he's trying to convince in this letter uh, to the church that, um, trying to convince the church members that their goal was still going on. And even though he's in prison, uh, that uh, it was not being stopped. So most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident of my change and, and 
more and more bold to speak the word of God without fear. Why are we not preaching the kingdom of God to the world? Why is it that we have kind of secluded ourselves in the church buildings and, and when terrible things are going on, like in the United States right now, we have same-sex marriage. We have legalized Sodom and Gomorrah. But, uh, and nobody's saying anything. And so uh, fear, uh, fear is the problem. But Paul then is promoting saying, hey, this is, this is releasing those people. They're not fearful now, even though they may wind up in prison, even as it was. And Paul, again, we see... In AD 54, 68, Nero was the emperor of Rome, and Paul was there then waiting uh, to go before him. He'd been there two years waiting. It may happen any day yet when he goes. Uh, he uh, simply Caesar's going to say, uh, uh, you're free, go on. It's not a problem. Or he's going to say, well, you're, you're a problem maker, and we'll just eliminate you. So he wanted to, to uh, have the churches to understand that this... Uh, uh, situation uh, was going on, and they shouldn't be uh, worrying about that. So historical analysis in our third point, if we went back to that chart, uh, and what was going on where it was received. Now, we want to talk about how it is with the church. And so in our study of the various elements of developing a primary relationship, we need to know about the church's relationship with Paul. We have heard about Paul, and he is saying, hey, our goal is still going on. But how did this work out with the, uh, with the church? Paul had been the leader in that church. He led them in evangelism, and he stayed there and taught them. And we need to know something about them. So we do historical analysis again. It is a noteworthy to witness to whom the Philippian letter was addressed. And for this within itself is unique. It was addressed in, in, in the, to the saints in Christ, but it included, and it's the only letter where we have this identification uh, with the elders and the deacons. Now, uh, all of the churches, wherever Paul was, so after the evangelism, as he said in Acts 14, 23, after they had finished their evangelism there of three years, he and Barnabas, that elders were ordained in every church. So that church government, of course, has been pretty much thrown out by the religious world in general. But this is what we need to understand. Uh, elders and deacons, then, that is, there are offices. There are qualifications of those, as we would read in the uh, uh, First Timothy third chapter, Titus the first chapter. There are offices, and then the church, then reading those, would then uh, make that appointment. And so uh, preaching and teaching are not offices. These are functions. But many times we've made the preacher the office. And so we need to uh, get over that. Just, just read the Bible and do what it says. Therefore, as he goes on to talk about what was going on with the church there in, Philipp uh, in the um, the Philippi, therefore, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so they had always been, in, uh, been obedient at Paul as the apostle for God, speaking for God, speaking for Christ. Then they had obeyed, and he's saying, okay, you keep right at it. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff, uh, doing the pleasure of God. And in this case, it is the evangelism. That's the number one uh, point that they're all dedicated to. Uh, and he goes on to say, therefore, my beloved and long for brethren, my joy and my crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Paul is saying, my success in evangelism and our success together, I'm over here still doing it. I'm still doing it. You need to do your side. So what we're understanding in a primary relationship then 
there is that goal that they all have together. And, but all of those people who are involved promoting that goal, then that needs to be the number one thing in their activity together. And so there was, uh, there was then a little problem going on there in the church between a couple of ladies, Yudaya and Sintaki. Uh, and he said, uh, make sure they're all saying the same thing. Uh, how, are, how are Christians going to think a lot? Well, we remember back in the first Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 10 through 12, there was the first where the, the church there in Corinth started to uh, identify with their teacher. I'm a Paul, I'm a Paulus, I'm of Christ, some were saying. But Paul said, no, no, you identify with what they preach, not with the man, you see. And so in that case, he said, you need to all have the same thinking. How is that going to do? We're going to learn to read the Bible for ourselves. A primary relationship. We all are thinking alike in this. Now, he goes on to say, uh, you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from you, I departed from Macedonia, I went on to preach in Thessalonica. He said, you supported me in this. Uh, yes, uh, financially support to help those people who are full-time in the evangelism business. Not full-time as simply one who has made this their, uh, this is my job. And so, a pulpit preacher. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about evangelists on the street, out there preaching the gospel. And the Philippian church was in that with them. And being in that with them, then uh, that's what Paul is addressing. So look, and understanding the historical setup helps us to understand what he says in the letter. Literary analysis, we want to understand what is being said in this particular situation, uh, we examine the paragraphs grammatically and contextually. Uh, in the reading the letter, where a paragraph becomes a thought. So letters move from thought to thought. We then are moving, if we're following the style of the writer, we are moving with his thoughts from thought to thought. This is literature, though. He's writing a letter, so there will be sentences in the thought. In the sentences, there will be words. And we need then to understand uh, the meaning of the words. We need the, mean, the meaning of the words. We need to get it's written in Greek, so we need to get us a good, good Greek dictionary so that we can see what was the meaning of the words. As we would see then, um, we follow his style through this. We are looking here as the reading of uh, this presentation is from Philippians 1.1 1, 1, all the way through the second chapter through 11. He's, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, the topic, one broad topic, but then there are many within that. And so we watch the thoughts within that. Follow the, or the author style, the movement in the letters from thought to thought. We keep aware of the literary signpost. Uh, we, we must there for, as, and, but, so, nevertheless, all of these are here, right here in this first chapter. Watch those signposts, pay attention to them, and know what the recipients knew. Uh, if they knew something we don't know, in other words, many churches never been taught the kingdom of God. Well, uh, the people who uh, received the letters, they were all converted to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, and the priesthood of Christ. That's what, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what's known as the gospel, when you see that word gospel. So we understand then that Paul used the standard form of that day uh, Tim Timothy, Paul, uh, were then those people who were 
the authors of this, <coughs> excuse me, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, that would be your second part in any form. This is standard. This is not a part of the regular letter protect the body, but this is form. And we need your son to understand that grace and peace to you from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Well, of course, that's where the grace is coming from. So that was a standard thought. Number four, the number four point in the form is prayer. Well, Paul's prayer, prayer led into the body, which is the fifth part. And the body of the letter here is one, uh, chapter 1, 3 through 420. Then there will be a close. So six elements are there in the form. All of those things we want to uh, make sure that we are up to date on. <coughs> Excuse me. Philippians 1, 4 then as we are beginning to look into the document and do our literary analysis. We are now ready to read this. We are going to move it from thought to thought. And as we move from thought to thought, then we have to be able to uh, know the meaning of the words in the sentence. Sentence functions in the paragraph are in the thought, as we would uh, move from thought to thought. But if we don't know what those words mean, uh, then we're going to have some problems uh, because words means what the author meant them to mean in that situation. Well, since they're said in Greek, we will need to go see the Greek words also. Always in every prayer of mine, making my request for all of you with joy. Uh, the word prayer comes in many different Greek words, but in this particular case, then, it was a warning. There's something he wants. Uh, his prayer to God for them. We want. We want to accomplish this goal that we're on of the fatherance of the gospel. So he, the word decides there. Uh, in the same one, request comes from a word similar to that. And so if we don't... Uh, uh, know the meaning of the words, we may not be able to read the sentence. We understand that, don't we? So in chapter uh, 1, 4, we are reading a verse. Now, these verses were not a part of the original. This was done later as someone made some arrangement to help us uh, maybe uh, to do that, but we understand we're dealing with a total thought here. The church in Philippi was Paul's joy and crown. Crown suggests victory. So the word uh, fellowship, then, we need to understand it definitely what that means. So all of these definitions have been here, set here for you, as you would look them up in case you don't have a Greek dictionary. You can get one, not too much. And so the word communion, communion. A communion, the Lord's Supper is a communion with the body of Christ. We, we break the bread to remember the body, and we are participating with him. It's a communion. Baptism is a communion. We die with Christ. We're buried with Christ. We're raised up with Christ. So the word, this word is a very common word. Paul is using it as a church. Uh, we are in this uh, fellowship together. We're talking about a primary, not a secondary relationship. Secondary relationship, we have many of those with people in our life. Hello there, goodbye, good to see you, so forth. Primary. Why do we need to know a primary? Well, primary deals with our marriages. Marriages break up when there's no primary relationship. And the kids suffer. Churches break up when there's no primary relationship and the members suffer. So fellowship, what does it mean? Gospel, what does it mean? Good news, a good message about the kingdom of God and Christ plus the grace of the priesthood. Without the priesthood, there's no grace. So in 2 Timothy 2.9, uh, we have then as this gospel, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. We did in a, the A100 series 
uh, there. We went back and all of the many scriptures in the New Testament talks about before time began. So we can understand what was in God's mind before he made the world. And so here, uh, that, that terminology is used. And he talks about when he's Paul, and again, this is second, uh, this is second Timothy. Paul is in probably a second time in prison. And here he was sure he was going to die. He knew that. But he is writing then. Uh, we're not just talking about the grace of God when we're talking about uh, good news. We're talking about the, the purpose of God, developing children of God for God in the kingdom of God. And that is being the purpose. Being confident, 1-6, being confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus. So he is in this Philippian letter, there in this evangelism, and he is carrying this thought all the way to judgment day. There is that, that urgency as we read the New Testament that Christ may come at any time. And so be ye faithful unto death, I'll give you a crown of righteousness, is the scripture. And so Paul and the Philippian church had uh, been together with Christ, in, with Christ Jesus in this good work in Macedonia. And since Paul received Jesus' call to go to help them, he was confident that it would continue until Jesus come again. And so as he's saying then, just as it right for me to think this way of all of you, he was emotional about his feeling for them. He is concerned that if he dies, they may think, well, where's the power of God? He is already working to convince them that the evangelism is moving. Even the guards here are being converted. Um, so he is saying, I have you in my heart. And, and that was a primary relationship. This is what we need to catch on to. This primary relationship in, includes God and Jesus. And this I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and discernment. So Paul has talked previously about what he was doing to keep this primary relationship going between them and him and preaching the kingdom of God. And of course, this is what Jesus wants done. So he's in this also. Uh, but now he's talking to the church how they need what they're going to be need to thinking about as they keep on the course with him. And so here he is saying, I pray then, this I pray that your love may abound. Oh, yes, we say, well, we got love. Well, if you notice in all of Paul's letters, it's always, well, let's take it from there. Let it abound more and more, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may, and the word Greek word would lead that to be best, the very best of things, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Coming again, that's judgment day. That is judgment. We are saved now by the grace of Jesus Christ priesthood. But that is saved from sin so that we then can develop as sons of God. Saved from spiritual death so we can have fellowship with, with God. And being filled with the fruits of righteousness. And now this is our doing. This is the third stage of learning. First stage of learning, we learn in the mind. Second stage of learning, we, we learn in the spirit of ourselves to have faith in what we learned in the mind. But Jesus taught us also, as he finished the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 24, now to make it who you are, you need to do it. And so uh, what happened then when they're fulfilling their goal of promoting and fathers of the kingdom of God is the fruits of righteousness, which are through Jesus Christ to the glory and everything is to the praise of God the Father. Jesus is there to the praise of God the Father. And so everything going to him. And Paul then in, in 112, he's backing off saying, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me are actually turned out to the fatherance of the gospel so that it has become evident 
to the whole polished guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident of my chains, are much more bold to speak. We're moving now from thought to thought with Paul, understanding his words, and they are there without fear fathering this gospel. We've seen that in our historical analysis. Here he's putting, we're reading it into the letter. Some indeed preach Christ, even from envy and strife, Paul had his enemies, and some also from goodwill. The former preached Christ from selfish ambition. Uh, very thing, hard to think of people preaching for selfish ambitions, but we know that anytime we're trying to help build a church for ourselves, um, Jesus himself said, I, I never come to do anything for myself. And so that, but that is there within human beings, supposing to add afflictions to my chain, but the latter out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. And getting in this letter with Paul, following his thinking, and here comes, for I know that this will turn out to be my deliverance. He is, he is saying to the church, we, we, we have hope. I may, I may live. I may live. Caesar may not condemn me to die. Uh, and he says, uh, through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Christ, we may come together again. Uh, we understand the word here as he talks about the word deliverance. Uh, coming uh, from sotia, that means his physical, physical salvation. Uh, we now see that same word, that same Greek word, sotia, we see it in 128, meaning spiritual salvation. We'll see that in a minute. But here, Paul is saying, for my deliverance. Now, if we, if we don't um, understand the Greek words, we may not catch the meaning. And of course, we need help in doing that. Uh, but we can, today, we have a much educated, more educated world of uh, uh, members of the ch church than were there, I'm sure, in Philippi in those days. And we also have many ages. We can Google anything. And uh, Siri is there to help us. So no, no reason why all of us can't read these simple letters for ourselves. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always now, and also in Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Somebody said, wait, we're, we're, we're carrying this thing too far. Not if we see the difference between our outer man and our inner man. Our inner man is the spirit that came from God that develops our soul. So they may kill the outer man, but the inner man is always there. So with understanding faith in the whole gospel, we can understand how Paul would say, for to me to live is life and to die is gain. Uh, can we say that? Well, uh, uh, spiritual growth and growth and faith in the God of his uh, eternal salvation. That will all be decided on the day of judgment and the, and the topic will be deeds at the day of judgment. It won't be about grace. So we need to understand uh, spiritual growth is what we're talking about. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for your labor. Yet, what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in flesh is more needful for you. So Paul is concerned, of course, with the church. Any leader to the church must be uh, concerned uh, with the temperament of the church, and he's trying to uh, get them to understand, I may or may not die, that's not the problem. The thing is, does, the, does our goal go forward? And being confident as I know I shall remain and continue with you uh, all for your progress and joy and faith that the rejoicing of me may be born abundant in Christ Jesus by coming to you. 
And as we move on in this first part of this letter, uh, we are reading Philippians 127, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Again, he's encouraging the church. I'm doing my side of, of this uh, primary relationship we have to Father and to Gospel. You have to keep doing yours. Um, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit and with one striving together for the faith of the gospel. So what we are saying is that from this, that we would learn what is a primary relationship. And we see right here then in our, in our position that we are standfast, one spirit, striving together with all the other saints for the faith of the gospel. So we note the entities in a primary relationship joined uh, as we would go back to the Ephesian letter because the Ephesian letter, uh, one of this prison letter uh, was loaded with so many themes. It becomes kind of a commentary on the other letter. So here he uses that terminology, joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies what holds the body of Christ together? Uh, the church, this is the church, is the body of Christ, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, uh, this is the church we read about in the Bible. This is the church that the world didn't like, so they started their own. And they're, they're, the city's full of them. You've got all kinds of different churches out there. But this is the one we read about in the Bible. It's not an argument. It's a fact. It's not who's right or wrong. <laughs> it's what's right. And this is, this is what's right here. That in this body, and he uses the analogy of a body so that we understand our body. We understand our body. If all the parts are not working, uh, I had a bad hip over here. They took it out and put something else in there. And so we need to understand that every member. So we see in Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 3 through 8, there are seven different ways you can function. He mentions there in that letter. And so we need to find out how am I functioning in the body of Christ? And so he say, goes on to say, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries. Well, in the Philippian letter in the third chapter, he will mention their adversaries, that, uh, which is from them a proof of perdition. In other words, their spiritual destruction was what he is talking about in that particular case. But for you, it is salvation. In this particular case, as we said before, this Greek word satia uh, is talking about the spiritual security. And that's coming from God. For you, you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to also to suffer for him. Right? <laughs> we have church buildings with padded pews and air conditioning in the USA and uh, if we don't, I, uh, some people will find another church. So striving together for a common goal is, is the entity in a primary fellowship that challenges selfish Christians. If we're being selfish, we're not going to suffer. We're not going to develop the goal of promoting the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ. So Paul said, having the same conflict with you as you saw in me, and now you hear is in me. So he said, we're both in this program together. You're suffering. I'm a suffering. The kingdom of God is put forth. And finally, he's winding up these thoughts as he goes to the second chapter. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and mercy, well, he's using the word if. 
What is the positive? That there is consolation in Christ. What does the word mean? You can see it down below. It's from the Greek word paraclesic, to call to alongside. So God, uh, uh, Christ is with us. God is with us there by his Holy Spirit. Christ is with us. He is there as a Christian's paraclete. That is our advocate and our propitiation. You can read that in 1 John 2, 1 and 2. That's how they're all there with us, working for this goal that the world may know the kingdom of God. God's spirit gives us, for Christians, he gives us spiritual life. By the way, two words there, paraclesis, paramuthis, and then that particular case, God is speaking to us. He's, that's what this word, the word comfort. He is speaking to us. How is he speaking to us? He's speaking to us in the word of God. Uh, he is telling us all these good things, the agape of God. That's a parental type love. It's not like just fellowships. I love you, you love me. No, this is, this is in that marriage when something happens, they're not loving one another. But if you've got that strength, that if you've got that strength of agape love, then you can work it out. But if it's just phileo, it's a weaker kind of love. You don't love me, I don't love you, this is over. Here goes the divorce court. What about the kids? Uh, what the heck? We must have a primary goal in life, in our marriage, in the church. Why? Because it's going to be a primary relationship in heaven. God's spirit's with with us. These are that's this is all having to do there with verse one, chapter two, one. Affection. Affection from a certain Greek mood that means from the inwards, from the inwards. We yearn within. Uh, pities. Pities from a Greek word refers to the seat of one's emotion that may foster acts of mercy. We, we look at children. Jesus looked at children and said, such are these the kingdom of God. Uh, Matthew 18, somebody, the, uh, the members, even the apostles, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? Well, he picked up a child and said, look at here. The child is born. He, he, has, that, he has that compassion in him. Uh, it gets kind of stomped out in the years go on. But it's still there. All of us have that feeling of compassion when we see terrible things happening to other people. But will it move us to do something, to be merciful and do something? Uh, that's what he's talking about in this situation. Uh, we will need to go on with this thought and wind up this presentation. And he does do that for us. And then in 5 through 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of man. Jesus Christ, the son of God, who was there with God in eternity before time, coming into this world then as man, and in the four Gospels, preaching to the Jewish people, then the kingdom of God also had apostle training school for about three and a half years. And so in Acts, what did they preach? The same thing. And that's where the churches all come from. He's writing to, and we don't understand what they understood. We will have trouble reading them. Being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, <clears throat> God also highly exalted him, giving him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should know bow. Those in heaven, those who have gone on, and those on earth, and those under the earth, those who have died, and so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of those, they're there all the way back. And so 
we all then come together in this family in heaven as God's family. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory and of the Father. Primary relationships then, of course, uh, is, is one of the very many things we learn from that. And it is most useful for understanding our life on earth uh, with other people. Thank you.